Happy Sabbath, church. How's everybody doing? Ooh, I guess I'm really a little tired. I didn't know the parents went to outdoor school, too. My kids are home. So hi, Ketsia. Hi, Sebastian. Uh, she woke up and said she couldn't move her legs and couldn't change because she was so tired from outdoor school. And little brother said, I miss my sister too much. I don't, I want to stay with her this morning, right? So uh, I want to say hi to Sebastian and Ketsia. My wife's probably not watching. She's uh, singing at an evangelistic campaign as well. Uh, but I'll look forward to uh, reuniting for um, gym night together with the family and church family uh, here tonight. But before I get going um, with the sermon, let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to gather here. We can still freely do so. We know there's going to be a time where there's going to be persecution. We're not going to have this amazing privilege to gather uh, and come in, in, in your name together uh, to worship you, to praise you, and to learn more about you. I ask that you, Holy Spirit, use me as an instrument that is through his um, power, through his voice, um, that I can preach a message from your holy scriptures uh, today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Well, church, um, I, you know, Pastor Dave was scheduled uh, to uh, preach today, but he was unable to be here um, because he's a little bit also uh, under the weather. He probably had just too much fun in, in outdoor school with the kids as well. Um, so I was, you know, um, he asked us who could pr uh, preach. He said, like, I've been working on, on two uh, concepts for the Bible um, that I think, you know, are, were just very interesting to me. But then I started praying, right? Because a lot of times uh, our human wisdom, we get a little stubborn. At least I get a little stubborn. And then I think, I think we should talk about this. Then through prayer, the Holy Spirit started to move me and said, you know, there's this thing that you work with so frequently, right? That, you know, I didn't consider it to be a biblical topic necessarily perhaps or something that I wanted to explore in Sabbath school or maybe in a sermon and then the more I started to prepare and develop um, God just moved me to speak about this element that I face very frequently in my job as a psychotherapist which is people struggling with that element of shame right this you know the there's a lot of information out there nowadays with uh, the the reduction of stigma with mental health and people are you know uh, speaking more openly about it at work at school um, they're reaching for information they may even start counseling they learn all these concepts all these skills that are very effective and then they fail to apply them like I know I need to be doing this but I experience some difficulty in being able to apply them Sounds a little familiar, right? Those, uh, those of us who have attempted to change, we get the information, we figure out a plan sometimes, and then we struggle. We get stuck, right? So um, it was, it's really interesting what happens uh, at that component. And I'll get a little bit more in depth uh, with what's going on in the brain. That's, that's the area that fascinates me and always excited with there's new technology that allows us to uh, to see what's happening uh, uh, in the brain, right? We still can't really study when people sleep. That's the other part we often feel, right? That's what I type. Are you? And he replied, I'd heard you walking in the garden. So I hid because I was afraid because I was naked. Now, this happens after the transgression, uh, after Adam and Eve eat from the forbidden tree, and they become exposed to sin. This is the moment in our human history where that bond is broken. We were connected to God. He came every Sabbath. That's amazing, right? Just like a day like today. He gave us this wonderful gift. And in the Garden of Eden, he would come down and spend time with Adam and Eve. Their connection was so close before sin that they could have that interaction. But then, 
as we read in Genesis. And this is Ellen G. White from Last Day Events, page page 249, I believe in Spanish. There's at times a little uh, page discrepancy when you go from English uh, to Spanish, but uh, around page 249 in your English versions from Last Day Events, uh, it says, the eyes of Adam and Eve were indeed open, but to what? To see their own shame and ruin, to realize that the garments of heavenly light that had been their protection were no longer around them as their safeguard. Their eyes were open to see their nakedness was the fruit of that transgression. And here we see uh, the very beginning of humankind after sin uh, enters this world through the, the actions of Adam and Eve, where human beings start experiencing this reaction of being afraid, feeling shame, right? Um, the word bond, right, when used more um, in, the, in the sciences, right, and I know we have amazing teachers here, so if anybody wants to correct me later on, please do so. But we see chemical bonds, right? That's the other way, uh, other place where you hear the word bonds, right? Uh, you have different uh, plastics that can bond to each other, different molecules, and then you can create a reaction. You can expose them to heat. You can expose them to a couple of different things. And sometimes we see that their bonds get stronger, which means they get together. It's harder to break. Or we see that there's a chemical reaction that makes those bonds weaken. The easiest example we can utilize is that of water, right? When you heat them up, those molecules start spreading, spreading so much that it becomes air. And it's separated. It cannot unite until there's a change that creates and makes those bonds closer to each other. Now, when it comes to our relationship to God, how close are we with him today? How close are we with God? He's died for us on the cross. He's cleansed our names through his blood. Yet, by the reaction that I see, and yes, I'm a psychotherapist, so I can kind of read body language at times. There, there's a little pause at times, right? And we're like, how, well, how close am I today? When that answer is we're right next to him. But the enemy, oh, I, he does it. I don't know how he does it. He is great. Well, I mean, he did it to Adam and Eve, right? So in, in a place where, where there wasn't any sin, he was still able to deceive humankind. We can be here. Those of us who are baptized, who have accepted grace, and you hear the type of question I make, and you're like, well, how close am I? Because the enemy is such a great deceiver. That the minute you are thinking about this, there's a little bit of doubt sometimes. And he makes you feel that you're far, far away from God. This is the limbic system. This is a brain cut through the middle part portion. And in psychotherapy, when whenever we study what's happening at the neurological level with regards to uh, somebody reacting with fear, somebody reacting, uh, being afraid, feeling shame, right? We look at this area of the brain. Um, we see the thalamus right there, the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, um, the singular gyrus. That's a fascinating uh, mechanism that kind of connects a lot of these uh, parts of the brain later on with the, our prefrontal cort cortex, right? But that yellow one, it's quite interesting what's happening there. That's the, that's the amygdala, right? That, that's one of the parts that's really active whenever we are feeling emotions in general, but whenever we're talking about shame, being afraid, uh, feeling scared, this part of the brain is just lights up. And we see that it impacts a bunch of these other places, right? And we then start seeing the cascade of reactions, right? Um, this part of the brain was probably got super active 
And without necessarily thinking, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve ran away and hid. In today's um, science, we describe that as a, as a sympathetic response, right? You might hear in, in different words, the flight or fight response, right? Adam and Eve were afraid. They fled the presence of God. They didn't feel worthy of being in his presence because of that transgression of sin. Whenever we start experiencing those human reactions that we have today as part of the, um, the sinful uh, uh, elements that we still carry on from uh, that uh, original sin in the Garden of Eden, we're going to be experiencing discomfort. Uh, perhaps like me, uh, my hand's a little sweaty, right? Maybe I'm a little afraid of being up here, although I do, I've done this multiple times, right? That's, that, that means that there's still a little bit of linger of what is going to happen, right? When we don't know, we cannot anticipate, sometimes a little bit of those reactions uh, occur there. Now, one of the elements that we study with regards to how secure a person feels, how confident a person feels, has to do a lot with attachment. Now, yes, there's attachment theory from uh, Dr. Bowlby, but there's also plenty of other research around the area of attachment, right? And um, Ellen G. White, around 85 years before the first uh, publication about this, she had already written how important the early years of our childhood are. How important it is for our children to be connected to their parents, to be connected to their teachers, to be connected to the Word of God through those wonderful Sabbath schools, right? Because it's in those early years where those parts of the brain start to make the connections between each other. When somebody feels a strong, secure connection with a caregiver, uh, some of you may have grown as latchkey kids, right? Some of you, your parents may have been divorced. Some of you grew up with your grandparents, right? So maybe your biological parents weren't always there, but if there was a, a, an adult, a caregiver, who you could trust, there's this ability to feel connected to them, to feel that you are protected. So anytime that amygdala starts acting up, when there's shame, when there's fear, when there's anxiety, there's somebody there. There's the knowledge that you are connected to them. And all of a sudden, all of that part of that limbic system quiets down. We feel a sense of calmness, a sense of safety. Unfortunately, like I was mentioning, there could be uh, some experiences where um, people grew up in a in a split home, right, through divorce. Uh, sometimes, you know, you had both parents, but they were working a lot, and there was an emotional distance, right? So when we talk about human interactions, it's really important to not just look at the ability and through COVID, now we're like, I'm really glad we can get together physically. But what is that connection that you have emotionally with your caregivers, with those significant people in your life? If you had the great opportunity, the great blessing of having those, the ability to understand that you can feel uncomfortable but safe is there. But when that is absent, we see people struggle connecting that prefrontal cortex, the front of our brain, the ability to reason, the ability to think logically. We, we see it in the, in, the, in the scans, right? It's, it's lighting up, but there's no connection with this specific part where the emotions are just really creating a, a big cascade of effects in the rest of our bodies. There's a disconnect even within us with what we think and what we feel. Paul says it, right? The flesh, I know I want to do this, but the flesh, right? And there's struggle making those changes, acting in the way that Paul wants to act. 
So at times we become disconnected from God. We become disconnected uh, from our significant others. And at times we have this internal disconnection between what we think and what we feel. I could go a little more deeper, but I'll leave it for another time because then we have the role of trauma um, that really creates a lot more of a challenge uh, in this brief example that I've talked about, trying to connect our reactions and emotional reactions to what's going on to what we think and what we want to do. That's safety, right? I was telling you that, you know, having strong connections growing up, having strong connections now are very helpful. But in the Bible, we see here that spiritually, that connection to God is what's going to provide that sense of safety, that sense of calmness. We are going to read Psalms 91 verses 1 and 2 here where it says, those who live in the shelter of the Most High will find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. This I declare about the Lord. He alone is my refuge, my place of safety. He is my God, and I trust in him. There's another psalm here, 62.5, where it says, Let all that I wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. We've sang praise hymns that speak about this. We've gone through Sabbath schools where we talk about this. We might have heard sermons where we talk about this. Yet there are times where we experience challenges and we know this, yet we feel afraid. We feel ashamed. This is still part because we are living in a sinful world. But it's not just that we are surrounded by sin. It's because of that component that I mentioned earlier before. That we do not feel a close connection with God. That some way, somehow, the enemy has deceived us, has made us feel unworthy has made us feel that we are not close to him, that we might need to do a lot of work to be close to him. This is a component of an active work. And it's not just knowledge. It's an action. It's that element of seeking him that is going to allow us to know, to feel that connection. And it's really important to understand, right, Because this is ultimately what's going to create that change that we were talking about when I used the illustration um, about water and the chemical bonds, right? There's something that changes, right? And here we see in Revelations 16, 15, where it says, Look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready so that they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. I hear, how many times have we heard the word ashamed in some of these passages, right? It is something that can still happen to us here in this sinful world, right? But through that amazing gift in the cross, Jesus Christ reconciled us with him. That transgression is no more through his amazing sacrifice at the cross, Sin has separated us from him. We can no longer be in his presence. But through this redemptive plan, we are able to reconnect with him. We are able to have a strong bond. We can have a connection. We don't need the early sanctuary anymore. The heavenly sanctuary has allowed us to connect with the Almighty. This is something that you and I have access today, that we have had access since his resurrection. We are reconciled through the almighty God. Now, 
Here's another amazing Bible verse. First Timothy 2, verse 5 and 6. And it says, For there is one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Christ Jesus. He gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. This is the message that the early church was hearing when they were not being accepted or even worse, when they were being persecuted. Just the right time. How many of you have family members, co-workers, um, classmates who are showing a lot of despair, who are showing a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear because of all the news? Yet we have an amazing message, right? That despite everything that's going on at this moment, there's one mediator, Jesus Christ. And that is the wonderful truth and gift that we have today. Because there's no judgment, right? Jesus came to this world, even though there was a transgression, right? We, we hear the word transgression, it's like consequences, punishment, things of that nature, right? But he tells us, he came to this world not to condemn us, but alaso. And alaso, it's not Spanish, it's not Portuguese either, right? This is Greek. This is Greek. Alaso comes from the Greek language, right? And this is in the New Testament when we're reading T Timothy here, uh, or as I'll quote John here in a, in a couple of minutes, right? This is the word that's in the scriptures. Alaso. This is a word, right? There is transgression through sin. And then Jesus Christ, through his sacrifice, has alasso with humankind. Yep, this is a word that we would use from the main title of the sermon. He reconciled. But what does that reconciliation mean, right? It means that our relationship has changed. That's what his sacrifice is. That's what the gift is. The relationship that was distant, the relationship that was broken, the relationship where we might even be afraid of God. I grew up in Latin America. We sometimes affectionately called uh, the Bible stories um, and explanations of our uh, 28 Adventist beliefs as the theology of La Chancla, which is, if you don't know this, you're going to be punished and judged, right? I, there's it's biblical, but the emphasis is, is more on that judgment and punishment, right? Instead of the reconciliation, which means that when I sin, when I do not behave in a manner that Jesus Christ did when he was walking as a human being, I feel like I'm going to earn punishment, which we all have earned death because of our sinful nature. Yet to that sacrifice of Jesus Christ, we have salvation. We are reconciled. Our relationship, sin doesn't have to get in the way between us and Christ anymore. Can it? Absolutely. That's, that's the whole thing the enemy is trying to do. Utilize sin to make you feel that you are unworthy of this gift. But that's why it is the word that is used when talking about that reconciliation is alaso, because Christ came here to change the relationship he had as God Almighty with the humankind. He came and sacrificed so that he could once more be united with us. Alaso, change that relationship. Now, one of the more uh, frequent verses that uh, we we hear when we um, talk about um, that that wonderful gifts is John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world that to oh wait wait that that's that's not where it ends. He gave his only son for what? For everybody who believe in him should have everlasting life, right? But, does the chapter end there? No, 
It's such an amazing component what happens next. Verse 17, because he came to this world not to judge it, not to condemn it, but to be reconciled with him. That's right next to 16, right? It's 17, right next to it. It's like, it's not just this gift. It's that through this gift, I'm no longer condemning you for the sins you have committed or the sins that you will commit. Because I want to change that relationship that sometimes we feel we have with God, which is feeling ashamed that we have sinned, feeling guilty, feeling afraid. And we have, when we have those feelings, we may do like Adam and Eve did. And instead of running close to him and restoring that bond, that connection, we run the other way. We hide from his voice. We hide from church. We hide from studying the Bible. We hide from praying because we feel scared or ashamed that we have sinned. This is one of the bigger components that I want to emphasize today because this is also impacts the way we interact with one another. The Bible tells us that we do live in this world but we are not of this world. One of the elements that is, is troubling to see, it's concerning to see, is that a lot of times we know these truths. We know these promises. Yet instead of acting like Christ, we act like the world. And whenever we encounter somebody, that division that's out there, where if I don't like what you say, I'm going to push you away. If I disagree with what you're saying, I'm going to push you away. If I disapprove of where things are going, I'm going to push you away. Now, that is the more natural response, right? When we don't have that security because it's we like the same things, we talk about the same things, that limbic system is going to just start firing up. And we have flight or flight, right, which sometimes run away. Or fight. That's the response that happens. This is the the divisiveness that we see. But God has told us that he's given us an amazing gift. First, between us and God. The two greatest commandments should love your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your might. And just like there's 316, it doesn't stop there, right? And then it says, and you should love your neighbor. He doesn't say you should love someone who you agree with. You should love somebody you approve of. You should love somebody that you like what they're doing. He's just telling us to love our neighbors. And our neighbors at times are going to do things we disagree of, we disapprove, or we dislike. And you just have to be mindful. I'm still mindful. I still struggle with this, right? Because if any of those things are happening, my initial reaction is going to uh, condemn or judge or criticize. That is just my sinful nature. I have it. I struggle with it. And yes, I have known these verses. I have known these techniques when it comes to looking at maybe from a little secular perspective with the work of psychotherapy. But knowing is not enough. We need that application. We need to live the truth that we have. And it's very hard, right? When I work in my sessions and people come with difficulties uh, from their past experiences that make them feel judged, they make feel ashamed, they feel all of the anxiety, there's plenty of Uh, techniques out there, but we spend months, we spend months working with them. And now and then, I have an amazing privilege to work with somebody who's a believer in Christ. And yes, those techniques are still applicable, but in the first or second session, I can bring one of these many verses, and I can highlight that the worthiness of no longer feeling ashamed ourselves comes from that wonderful gift that God gave us. And once we know that our relationship has alaso, has changed, and we can connect with him, 
we can tap into that unimaginable, universal, I don't know how huge that love of God is. And we just tap into a little portion of it. And then the next time we encounter a situation when we feel scared, ashamed, or maybe even angry that somebody has done something we disliked or disapprove of, we have that initial mm, judgment, condemnation. But then we are filled with that love. And we can reconcile with one another. We can change that interaction of fighting, of getting distance. And what is love but a strong, secure connection? And that's what we have through the wonderful gift that Jesus Christ gave us in the cross. This is something we can access. This is something you have heard. But the message that I have for you today is that that connection can fade away if we don't work on that daily. Going back to Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 8, this is the Shema where every little child, even today our Jewish neighbors here uh, next door, right, they tell us, hear God, O Israel. You have one God. And these truths, you should love him with all your might, all your heart, and you should review them and walk in these truths every day and you shall teach them to your children in the morning and at night we need to reconnect we need to engage in our personal devotion and we need to look for ways to activate to act on that amazing knowledge that amazing gift that christ has given us the enemy is going to use everything in his power to make you feel unworthy but through that sacrifice We have been reconciled. Since the cross, our relationship with God has been changed. And it will change one more time when he comes again for us. And that is a promise we know he will fulfill. Please bow your heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this amazing gift you have for us. We can connect with you once more. There's going to be a moment that we'll have a Sabbath in heaven. I cannot wait to see what that is. But in the meantime, your Holy Spirit is here with us, and we are able to connect with you as you have washed our sins away through your blood. We can experience that connection with you. Please help us seek you every morning, every day. Please help us use that love and safety and security that we have in you to share with others, to share with those who we disagree with, to share with those who might have hurt us. By showing that love, we'll be able to reach many, many more people than through some of these services, than through some of our missionary work. We can witness every single day that through your love, we have been reconciled. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.